that's why you get paid a lot. All right, we're doing our last little bit of uh, subject matter here. We're uh, going to look at what happens as things are um, su structural support members as columns. It's not unlike what we uh, started with. In fact, uh, I'm not real sure. Well, part of why, you'll see in a second why we couldn't have done this in the first week because uh, we did start with this type of loading in the first week. Uh, that's where we first introduced, of course, our uh, notion of the normal stress. And uh, we'll use that again this morning. But we didn't look at anything more than just that normal stress. Um, we assumed that the only deformation would be uh, if, if the material was ductile, then it would deform something like that. And if it was brittle, it would deform something like, well, I don't even need that outline. If it was brittle, it would deform something like uh, this. It would just fracture along the line and slip. That's what concrete does. Concrete's our best example of a, of a brittle material that's used in compressive support like that. Um, and, and we even looked at why it would be that angle. Remember that the, the maximum shear stress in uh, axial loading was at 45 degrees. You remember back when we did that? So that's that's very much what that's your, you know, it's not as nice and neat as that. It might be a couple 45 degree angles in a couple directions making it look like a pretty jagged thing. But you go look at a piece of uh, uh, concrete or brick that fractures in axial loading like this and it's, it's just amazing when you look closely, however, it almost looks like it's, you'd expect it to be a crystalline structure, you know, when everything lines, all the crystal, all the atoms line up nicely in a crystalline structure, and then you get fractures along those planes. You almost think that that's, that's the kind of thing going on. But we're gonna change uh, a little bit now in our, our look at this. The, uh, those are not the only possible modes of failure. Um, this is a, a failure in that things might not fit right, even if the uh, load is taken off and the thing goes back to its original shape. It might be such that that deformation is too great to, uh, to be managed. Uh, certainly that's a catastrophic kind of failure. But uh, the type of failure we're going to look at now is very apparent with much longer members in axial loading because what they tend to do then is um, buckle. And so we're going to look at that kind of possibility because uh, uh, we now know what can happen to material when it's in a bending load like this, uh, which is something we didn't have in the first week when we were doing axial loading that led to our normal stress concerns. So we'll take uh, a look now at what uh, what the bending loads are in these, what kind of moments uh, are being caused, and what kind of uh, normal stresses that leads to using uh, our, our bending uh, the bending uh, formulas we, we came up with uh, in the last month month or so that we've been working on that kind of uh, problem. We just had transverse loads to cause the bending. Now we're going to look at axial loads causing this bending. So to get things going, our model is going to be something like this. We'll imagine that the top is supported such that uh, um, it can roll up and down this channel sort of thing. So there's, there's no possibility of sideways deflection of this load. This load starts in this direction, uh, in this place, and stays there. The only possible thing it can do, of course, is this all gets a little bit shorter. But the load can't deflect sideways, which is going to be a completely different problem. That's not buckling. That's uh, 
that's you know some kind of structural failure uh, of, a, of a cross member that would have held it there. So our, our initial model is that we can allow the top of it to roll up and down um, as needed, but just can't deflect sideways. Then the piece itself can deflect, but we're going to model this deflection as a two-piece member pinned at the bottom, pinned in the middle, with a spring here to represent the elastic nature of the material. So that uh, if we release the load, then the material, the, the object will return to its neutral position on its own. So this will be our first model for, for this, type of, uh, this type of loading. Fairly simple, uh, but leads to perfectly uh, usable results, which, uh, which most of our simple models do. Thank God. I mean, thank whoever. All right, so we'll take a, a free body diagram of this joint. So there's the little piece there. And of course, uh, it's pushing on the spring, so the spring's going to push back on it. Um, we'll just call that F. We'll be done with that for now because, of course, there isn't actually a spring there. And then uh, in response to both the load and the spring force, there are, of course, then two forces there, symmetrically directed. Uh, these are just two force members, so we know that the forces lie directly along those. Not quite symmetric there in the, in the drawing, in the cartoon. Oh, I'll never call them cartoons again. Maybe someday I'll tell you why. Uh, so we've got, we've got that um, equilibrium condition free body diagram um, of the forces on that joint. And it's this deflection there that we're concerned with. So we'll even use the same symbol we had for deflection. Um, in the last uh, week or two, we've been talking about that. So that's, uh, that's going to represent our deflection there. So let's put some little things together. Let's see uh, uh, a column of length two, uh, L. So that's L over 2 itself. So then we can uh, uh, put the rest of a little bit of model together if we want. Uh, let's see. Uh, this piece here, that will be P itself, the vertical component. And if this angle's theta, then this length here is P tan theta. And V will be, um, for very small angles, we've done this kind of approximation before, V is very much like the arc length. And so we'll be, we'll be very close for very small angles to something like L over 2 theta. So we can finish with our little bit of a, of a picture here. Let's see. Uh, F is K, K, uh, K nu, uh, or KV, um, where K is, the, or K is the, the representative spring constant um, of that spring. Yeah, we don't know what it is. We don't actually have a spring there. But we're going to be done with that in a second, as you can imagine on these type of things we couldn't do before. And so putting the deflection in, hello Bobby, putting the deflection in, we've got K theta L over nu, something like that there. All right, so that's, that's
that's the spring force, the, the spring force we're using to model the elastic bending of this, uh, this column under axial load in, in uh, some kind of buckling, uh, but buckling response, but we're going to try to avoid buckling failure, of course. Uh, and that, that uh, leftward horizontal component must equal two of these rightward horizontal components, two because there's one top and bottom in each of the members. So this must equal then itself 2p tan theta. So the, that's just saying the right side's got to equal the left side for equilibrium. All right, we can tidy things up a little bit. Again, use our small angle approximation that tan theta is very close to theta itself. Uh, again, remember in radians. Um, and then we can then say, so uh, P equals, uh, we get the two over the bit K, the thetas, theta cancels tan theta, we get K L over four. That about right? which is um, what we're going to call the critical limit. If P is uh, less than that, we're okay. And if P is greater than that, then we have uh, uh, failure. So we want to, uh, being of, of a gambling nature, we want to hit right at P as the critical limit and then uh, then take our chances that it won't fail and, and make sure that we're out of the country if and when it does. So we're going to look at that as our, as our critical limit for failure. Uh, trouble is, of course, that we've got that uh, spring constant in there when there isn't really a spring in the problem. So um, we're going to have to deal with that here very, very quickly. All right, fair enough for a, for a simple model to get us started for, for the buckling response of a, of a column. Yeah? That's, that's not supposed to be over um, four? Oh, over four, yeah, sorry. Yes, it is supposed to be over four. What, what, what's your problem here? All right, there we go. See, it's over four. You can check the tape. But see, it's over four. All right, so that's what we got. We, we're we're uh, we're gonna be on the verge of failure. Throw in a good factor of safety, and uh, everything will be be uh, happy after that. So, uh, a little bit different look at our uh, simple model here. Kind of looks like a guitar, I think. Now we'll go back to the more realistic response of this thing. Simply pinned at the bottom under some kind of uh, axial load. And this is all supposed to be uh, symmetric there. So um, let's take a look at this more like what we've done in the past where we now take a look at the interior forces, the moments that are being caused there, and the bending response to those. All right, so uh, this, this uh, even as a sub-piece, must itself be in equilibrium. So we know that there's a, a normal force there, P, because of the deflection, though, that sets up a couple that must be uh, reacted to with some moment. We have a couple that way. We must have a moment interior response moment, uh, something like that. Okay. 
we understand that kind of uh, bending moment because we've been looking at that for a couple uh, a couple weeks now. We know that uh, that uh, it's um, a factor of the flexural rigidity. Remember that has to do with the material. Uh, chosen for the beams and whatever the moment, area moment of inertia of the beam itself is times the second derivative of the uh, deflection curve itself where X will uh, just take from one end. All right, so let's see. Uh, so, oh, uh, and that has got to equal minus P times uh, whatever the deflection is. Minus because that's our, that's our uh, uh, convention for that, that direction. Okay, so far, everybody comfortable with that? So far, nice to that. That's why we couldn't do this buckling kind of thing in the first week when we first looked at axial loads. We didn't have this. Uh, it took us a while to get there, but uh, now we can um, we can solve that. So let's see. Uh, so d squared v d x squared plus P over E I V equals zero is one of the solutions for that. We wanna we wanna see what uh, what would give us a, a say a zero bending moment uh, for that that type of thing. Everything looks right. All the minus signs in place. Yeah, we're okay. Um, this. You should be excited about seeing this kind of thing. What is this thing? Second order homogeneous linear differential equation, which you have probably already solved in your mind. Have you not? Do we? Did you? You were there already with that? Come on, you're all in Vivi Q, aren't you? Did you need to see it in that form? Now, now you're okay with it? No. You're not excited to see that? Everybody's always, all students are always excited to see differential equations up here in their work. Because now they say, now I get it. Now I know why you're making me do that. Okay, with solutions for the deflection, of C1 sine lambda x plus C2 cosine lambda x, where lambda squared is the P over EI. Right, that's one of the solutions you use for this type of thing. You, you've been here, um, even if the recall of it isn't immediate. Um, so we got to get rid of the, of the uh, the constants by using boundary conditions. Uh, we really only have two boundary conditions involved in deflection. At x equals zero, the deflection is zero. Remember, I had it purposely put in that in that sort of roller channel that made it look like the top of a guitar. And then also at the bottom, it was pinned, so there will also be deflection there. I mean, no deflection there. Um, gives us probably one of the most conveniently simple solutions ever that zero equals zero and, and we're all done and we go home early. Because uh, what more can you do with such a perfect, clean, simple solution is zero equals zero. So what we'll do is uh, we'll let one of them go to zero and then use the other one instead. So uh, our book has chosen to let this one go to zero and use the solution to that one, which then gives us the uh, 
the uh, possibility. Uh, what's the, when x equals zero, the sine of zero is 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 zero itself. But you know, we get around that. Um, with uh, different modes to it. No, not P. P over EI. Uh, X. Then uh, that part equals zero. So uh, I guess I guess to better say it, we'll, we'll take that boundary condition on that one and then just use this one. So we get that and we get uh, then different modes um, of the solution itself where n can be integers from uh, one to however many. Where the solution for n equals one is a buckling response of of that, uh, and this this in fact you this is a, very much the same type of thing you saw in physics two when you did uh, vibrations. Yes, no. You didn't do vibrations in physics two, or you did and you didn't remember. We'll go down. Anyway, this is this is one of the harmonic modes. If you if you shake a, a rope at the slowest frequency, you can get it to do that. And if you change the frequencies, then you can get the next modal responses, where the second one is this response. Uh, these are all, all buckling uh, type responses and, and it's very easy to see the first response with a simple column that buckles easily without much force at all it'll go into the first mode of buckling uh, well not failure I'm not going to push it that hard then I have to pay for this uh, I could greater muscle, get it into the second mode. You, you can see that the natural response is the first mode. The second mode is going to require a lot more uh, force. Um, also, it, it, it would require some kind of support at the center here to induce that. You know, if there was a, if this was a column in a building and there was a second floor here, and then the top floor here, and that was the load, you might get that type of response. But uh, it's a very difficult one to even even model uh, in a simple way there. So that gives us our first solution then where n equals 1. And so now we have our critical limit. We can bring all this a uh, little bit back together. Of, uh, where am I? Got to get it right. Pi squared. EI over L squared. So the critical force, uh, of course, has something to do with the, whatever the column itself is. And again, the area moment of inertia plays a critical part in this. But it's inversely proportional to the length, which means a shorter column has a greater critical limit. You can put more load on a short column than on a long one. And that's also easy to demonstrate with a really long column. It takes almost nothing. Uh, uh, an, an old, decrepit professor like me has no trouble getting some bending going here. But a column of half the length, it's significantly harder. You, can you see the strain? in my muscle fibers there. Did you see, see the, the, the ten line? The, 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 it's much harder. You, you know, easily stand up, give it a try. You'll, you're, you'll be amazed 
at how little it takes to buckle this and how even a young buck, I don't know, I might try, try, try. Come on, give it a try. I will tell uh, Mary Leslie if you break it. Don't, but see, yeah, yeah. No, that one, there's nothing to it. Yeah. Bobby, want to give her a try? <laughs> no? How often do I bring out visual aid? Colin, Colin's dying for it. Forget you, Jason. <laughs> So you guys, doing activities here at the it was good, wasn't it? Weren't oh, you yeah. glad when you finally did it? You guys, I'm going to put these over here so you can't get to them. You've lost your one chance. You had a chance to do it. Pat stepped up, took the chance, enjoyed it. But you guys couldn't do that. All right, so we have now finally our critical load limit. We go above this for a column of this description. We uh, greatly increase the chance of failure. We stay below that. In fact, if we stay well below this critical limit, we're uh, in much better shape uh, to avoid buckling failure by, uh, by that axial load. What's the lambda value that you have up there? Is that useful or? That, what, do you, what do you guys call that in differential equations? It's the, yeah, you, maybe you use a different symbol than lambda. You use omega. Um, so you'd have omega squared in the differential equation of the solution. Does it mean anything in this course though? Uh, it, it means exactly what it meant in, the, in any of the diff those differential equations oh, yeah. where it's a, it's a collection in a way of, of the pertinent um, uh, the, the pertinent variables, I forget the term. Frequency that, that helps the oscillations, like the order yeah. here. While this isn't oscillating, it looks exactly like right. uh, uh, a flexible member in an in oscillation. So let me just copy that back down there. Because there's our critical load limit for buckling, but don't forget that this is all still just axial loading, so we also have a critical limit on uh, the normal stress that we got back in the very first week. We can't uh, violate either one of these. It's not one of those cases where if one's okay, it's all right if you exceed the other. You can't exceed either one because uh, if we protect against buckling, but then it fails by uh, normal stress failure, what good is protecting it from buckling when the thing fails anyway? All right, uh, let's see, we've got, uh, we've got one little, one last little piece to put in here. Um, uh, it's going to be a little bit of switch from dynamics uh, using the uh, radius of gyration like we do in dynamics. However, this, uh, we're going to give the symbol not K, not, which we use in dynamics because we ought to use K for something in here, so we don't want to mix that up. So uh, our book happens to use R. And so the, the uh, radius of gyration. However, uh, remember uh, our moment of inertia we, in uh, dynamics, we have a mass moment of inertia. This is an area moment of inertia. So in dynamics, we did I over M. And here we do I over A since it's a, an area moment. Um, for constant thickness, constant density, solids, this comes out to be the thing, same thing anyway because the, uh, the density would, and thickness would cancel out of it. And most of the things we're looking at are constant density and constant thickness. So then uh, we, we put that in. And we get our last little piece to it. 
that uh, I guess column designers like to use. So we have uh, the I coming out, one of the L coming, L's coming out. Because we define this as the slenderness ratio. Ratio. Which, if you're watching the royal wedding this morning, the new princess, the Duchess of Cambridge, has a very high slenderness ratio. She was, and, and her, her sister too. Two very, very slender <laughs> young ladies. All right, so uh, oh, what is, well, our symbol for it in this class is nothing. We just uh, we just separate it out. Pi squared d over l over i. I getting this right? No, sorry. L over where'd the r go? Uh, I. Over oh I got a in here I need yeah I need a in there so we're a little short on the yeah we're a little short on the geometry uh, that's okay no what I want to do is uh, yeah that's okay we'll do that but then we'll make another shift for it this is all just uh, uh, algebra which is the general place where I get screwed up anyway so. Let's get that uh, radius of gyration in there. That's what we're trying to introduce here. Um, and then we need an A in here. So there, I think that's okay. Is that all right with the, uh, with the algebra? Pi L over R squared, yeah, pi squared, yeah, okay, that's right. That's the, that's the piece we needed there. I R squared over L squared times E A. No, we had pi squared, so we can even take the squared out somewhere. Yeah. All right, there we go. So um, it's it all just comes down to geometry of the of the column. Everything okay with that? Do I get all the algebra straight finally? What? This one? Yeah, the R squared should go up top. Because That's not okay? Because the R squared does come up top. Once we take that, invert, and multiply. Yeah. I think it's okay. If not, uh, it's a little tiny algebra thing there. Uh, because I know that last one's the right bit we needed. But the whole thing comes down to uh, geometry, radius of gyration of the cross section, length, uh, which we've already seen is a big deal. We knew uh, uh, the area has always been a concern with this. So let's uh, let's give it a test. See what it means to us. So. Uh, a, We'll look at a, a Douglas fir column, say just exactly the type of thing you put on a deck. And dimensions on the piece, a two by four, very common structural element in a, in a deck. We'll uh, put some axial, I mean some uh, coordinate directions on it. X will be axial, of course. We'll take Y up, Z across, just like we've done before. Douglas fir has a uh, Young's modulus. Of course, we're going to need that of 1.9 times 10 to the 6th PSI. And a normal stress limit. Remember, we've got to look at both the buckling and the normal stress 
limits times 10 to the third psi. So let's uh, let's figure out what we can do with that kind of that kind of um, column. All right, so let's find the slenderness ratio. And the allowable load with a factor of safety of one and a half. Okay. Really straightforward. I hope, let's see, what's the slenderness ratio? You wrote it down, didn't you? You were thinking of the new, the future queen. She was so pretty. And it, it was amazing. As she came up in her limousine, and they, the, the, the reporters pointed this out. She was holding her bouquet with one hand and waving with the other. That's how relaxed she was. Because if you're not relaxed, you need two hands on a bouquet. You didn't watch that this morning. You went up at 4 a.m.? Well, another history. You missed Love Canal, and now you missed the uh, Royal Wedding. God dang. If you guys you do you're taking part in anything. So the slenderness ratio, remember, is the ratio of the length to the radius of gyration to the, uh, the cross-sectional uh, area. And then remember, R is the square root of I over A. So, what's the matter? I over L? Is that what I wrote down? Who you been listening to? No, it says right here, L over R. Well, unwrite it. You're taking notes in pencil, aren't you? Don't you? After after all these weeks with me, you wouldn't take notes in pen. That'd be the dumbest thing you could possibly do. Sorry, it's wrong. It's it's L over R. I didn't mean uh, L over, well, whatever I said, I didn't mean it. <laughs> it doesn't even have a symbol, so we'll give it SR for slenderness ratio. All right, sorry about that. I'm, I'm just, it's the, she, the, she was so pretty. <laughs> and uh, finally we saw, we got to see her dress. She's running along in the limousine too, she has a veil over her head. You can barely see her shoulders, and they're saying, oh, we finally see the dress. Look how pretty it is. And you can just barely see her shoulders through the veil, through the window, as she zips by. Those reporters, they need to get a life. Apparently, I do too. <laughs> All right. So, uh, uh, seems like a, a fairly simple thing to do, except um, there's uh, a little bit of a concern in that the slenderness ratio that we now understand and has to do with the moment of inertia of the area. The moment of inertia with respect to the y-axis is different than that for the z-axis. So which of the two slenderness ratios is the smaller? Because remember the slenderness ratio itself is on the top so if we have the smaller one of those, then we know that's the smaller of the, the critical load limits. Since I, Y does not equal I, Z, then we need to find out which one of those is smaller so we know which uh, radius of gyration is smaller so that we have the uh, uh, the best protection, the, the greater the slenderness ratio, the better the protection. 
the Y is showing? Is it? Small piece. Yeah, remember the moment of inertia for a rectangular solid is one twelfth bh cubed. So whichever one has the smaller dimension in there is the worst direction, and uh, that's of course the smaller direct uh, smaller um, of, of the of the two two and four. So the i z is much smaller than uh, I, uh, sorry, I, Y is much smaller than I, Z. Um, I don't even happen to have them calculated out. Is this one really like the small one or the bigger one? Well, you put, put the numbers in and answer that for yourself. But I, Y is going to be the smaller, as Jake said. That's what you said, Jake, right? Yeah. Because uh, remember, perpendicular to the axis is the base that has the smaller. I mean, uh, uh, is the height, uh, so that has the smaller moment of inertia. So we want a radius and gyration with respect to the y-axis. units, of course, the length is in feet, the radius of gyration using what we have here would be in inches. Then we need that in the critical calculations themselves. <coughs> Remember the critical load was pi, uh, pi L over R squared E A. Oh. And so we need the slenderness ratio in there. And the greater that is, the greater our load, critical load is. What Doobie, what I do now? Did I screw something else up? I had R over yeah. I R over L screwed. Okay, hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on. No, no, sorry. I'm having memory trouble for this term. It's driving me nuts, as you know as well. I apologize. But what? Inverse of the SR. Yeah. SR is on the bottom then. Pi over SR if you want. But the book doesn't use a symbol for the slenderness ratio. Yeah, see, we wouldn't have caught that inverse with the units because the units would still work out. Slenderness ratio is unitless. The, the slenderness ratio for us to use. Again, we want the smaller one because the inverse of it is the bigger. We get a better protection limit. Confirm 104. Believe it or not, that's what I got too. Now, you can see that indeed that's the right response because if the uh, 
weaker direction is the y direction, a moment in that direction is going to cause it to bend um, uh, towards the towards the bigger side, and that's exactly what a column does. It, this will deflect side to side, but it will not deflect towards us because the greater slender or the lesser slenderness ratio is uh, about the y-axis, which in this case would be across the face like that. So the bending moment then is that way. And that's just how these things tend to, to fail. What, Jake? Colin, you got 104? Uh, I got half of that. I have 52. Yeah, that's what I got. 52? I have 104. You used uh, the right moment of inertia. You got 104, Doobie. So it's a tie, Pat. I got 105. Oh, I got 104. I got 104. What do you have for uh, the radius of gyration? Radius gyration, uh, I over, square root of I over A, um, which is 1 12th one twelfth um, 4 inches times 2 inches cubed. Is that right? No, because that would have been I Z. This is I, right? This is I. Right. And then over two inches times four inches. And then the square root of that. And do I have that number? Uh, yeah, a little over a half, almost a sixth. That straightened it out, Jake? Yeah. Okay. Colin, okay? Yeah, I just thought the base was too, because it makes sense that the Y is like going up or going vertical. Uh, now, re remember the, uh, uh, the picture in the book, I think, is like that. Oh, okay. With, uh, uh, with a, a reverse direction. So you have to be very careful that you're getting the right orientation than the right B over H cubed, or B times H cubed. All right, then we can uh, calculate the, uh, the critical limit. So the factor of safety goes into wait, it was 1.5 times the critical limit you find? Uh, not, not times it, because that increases it. That uh, makes you think that you can put in a greater critical load than you can. So you want to divide the critical load into this. Because remember, this is the critical limit. Anything over that will cause buckling. Anything under it is safe, so you, want, you know you want to go to the lower number. So, uh, you can calculate this straight out and then just divide by the critical limit, uh, the critical load, or you can uh, reduce it by the factor of safety there if you wish. But we're, we're looking for the maximum force that we can support without buckling uh, so the lowest possible calculation that comes out for that is the safer. Up to the point zero, I guess. Uh, but
but so we have all those numbers now. Okay. 